you know, we've we're all studying a bunch of different things here. I've really been focusing in on evapotranspiration lately. Um, I think it's really interesting, and especially in the urban environment, um, if we can really take advantage of evapotranspiration um, and not just the infiltration component or peak flow rate component of these different stormwater control measures, then we can get even more bang for our buck. So um, we've been, we're on our second grant now where we're looking at evapotranspiration in a few of these different stormwater control measures. And we'll see all of them um, on the tour today. Um, one is sort of being changed out right now that I'll get into on the tour. Um, so some preliminary data, some is a little bit further along than others. So evapotranspiration, um, you know, basic component of the hydrologic cycle. And when you look at a lot of different state or municipality um, manuals for how to design different stormwater control measures, everyone says evapotranspiration is really, really important but no one really gives a good way to quantify it, or it's sort of difficult sometimes to get credit for it. So we are thinking of how can we try to see how big of a part these different um, systems have where evapotranspiration is a big part of that, or how can we start figuring out how to predict and account for it so we can get credit for it more easily um, as we go through permitting. And this is basically what I just said. So um, this is the system that is being revamped. This is looking at our rain gardens. Um, the data that I'm going to be showing you, this is what we're calling our um, bioinfiltration with an underdrain. So the water goes through and then can immediately leave the system. So water moves through the system pretty quickly. Um, the middle one right here is just a control. And this one is what we call our bioretention with an internal water storage layer. <laughs> so the way we figured out how to measure this evapotranspiration was we were just going to weigh the system over time, monitoring the flow in and the flow out. Any change in weight could be related to the change in evapotranspiration. So we call this our weighing lysimeter. Um, this is a tension lysimeter, uh, so or a tension load cell. Excuse me. We take the weight measurements every five minutes. And we've been doing this depending on the system. Um, these systems, we have about two years worth of data. Our green roof system, which I'll show you in a moment, um, we have nearly four years worth of data at this point. Um, so again, kind of with an under drain with the internal water storage layer. And what we see, this is just some of our data. And to step you through, so the blue dots are what we actually observed as our measured ET. And this is just the average monthly um, evapotranspiration, just a little bit easier to look at as opposed to daily data or um, anything in smaller increments. The red is in the agricultural sector who has done a lot of work in evapotranspiration. They use the Pem and Monteith equation. It's recommended by FAO and the American Society of Civil Engineers. So that is sort of how much evapotranspir evapotranspiration can you get climatologically, right? What's available in terms of the energy. And then this is the weight of the lysimeter, which we can use as a proxy for understanding how, um, how much water is in the soil itself. So we have 2010 and 2011. And as you might remember, in 2010, August and September, we had a drought. And you can see how the weight goes down. And then we also had a drought June and July of 2011. So we're using this weight, again, kind of as a proxy for water soil and moisture conditions are, this is for the rain garden with an underdrain. When we have plenty of water available, we can have a lot of evapotranspiration. transpiration. When we don't have water available, we don't have a lot of evapotranspiration. So kind of like the federal study where fish need water, we came up with the shocking conclusion that to get evapotranspiration, you need water. Right? And so this sort of brings us into, well now let's look at this rain garden with the internal water storage layer. So we are providing our system with water. We're letting water stay in the system. Um, this came on a little bit later, and you see that August and September 2010 was that drought period, but we were able to maintain a decent amount of water in the system, especially um, in August. So we were still able to get evapotranspiration at a higher rate, this is seven, seven millimeters on average as opposed to four 
millimeters on average with the internal water storage layer. Um, so we're able to get this process and everything that goes along with evapotranspiration. So, you know, minimization of the urban heat island effect and things like that, not just treating the stormwater itself. Moving right along, we're also looking at our green roof. This is our longest study, um, again, we have about four years worth of data. So this is our weighing isometer here. Basically the same concept, but instead of a tension load cell, we have compression load cells, again, taking the weight every five minutes. And basically we took a cross section of the regular green roof and plopped it into this little 18 inch by 18 inch box. The only difference in design is the real green roof has an under drain system and the weighing lysimeter box does not. And anecdotally, what we saw, again confirming our brilliant conclusion that to have evapotranspiration you need water, we saw pretty good evapotranspiration from the green roof. We also saw during those drought periods of 2010 and 2011, where these plants didn't do so well, these plants remained nice and lush, which is what we saw in our rain garden lysimeters as well. So again, a little bit longer period of data here, and we don't get quite as much evapotranspiration um, from a green roof as we do from a rain garden system, different types of plants, shallower system, you know, many of these different components. But we're getting a pretty consistent amount of evapotranspiration during the height of the growing season. We dip down a little bit in the winter time, but we're around three to four millimeters on average per day, which again, you add that up over the year, it can be substantial. Um, so we're pretty happy with this, and we're working with adjusting the pendant on teeth equation for stormwater control measures right now. So now we're into the modeling phase um, for the green roof. Lastly, we wanted to look at a constructed stormwater wetland. This one seemed to be the most difficult to figure out how to measure it. We went through several iterations just because there's constantly a lot of water in these systems, and they're really heavy. So to get the weight of it with the accuracy that we needed, um, we switched over to this system. The data you're going to see is from when it was in a greenhouse, now the system is outside. And basically, we made a bucket, which is right here, where we created a little wetland. And then we attached this to a Marriott tube so we can control and keep a constant level of water in the wetlands and we can measure how this water level is dropping with a good amount of accuracy. What we saw, which was really interesting, when we had sort of prime conditions, so the height of the growing season, a high energy day, plenty of water because it's a wetland, so water's always available, we were getting over 20 millimeters per day um, on average for the constructed stormwater wetlands. That's a lot, you know, I mean, we're talking nearly an inch of water per day is going to evapotranspiration. Wetlands, you know, they're larger structures and often just thought to be peak flow rate reducing systems, but annually they could be volume reducing systems as well. Um, so we've moved this outside to see how it does over the entire season actually outside, different wind effects. We applied wind and did it, but again, in a very controlled um, type setting for the wetland system. We had grad students breathing. Yes, yes. So they are full of hot air. Oh, that's the professor. Yes. Um, so with that, again, the whole question um, and 